On behalf of New America's Education Policy Program, welcome to Making the Grades, What State Policy Report Cards Reveal About Education Reform. I am Anne Heislip. I'm a policy analyst here with our Education Policy Program, and I focus mostly on K-12 standards and accountability, NCLB and waivers, um, as well as sort of the intersection between state and federal policy reform. Um, so to get a few logistics out of the way first, definitely grab coffee and food. Sorry for those who are watching online. Hope you have your second breakfast as well. Um, and we'll be tweeting throughout the event um, using our Twitter handle at New America Ed, at Students First, we'll also be tweeting. Um, and using the hashtag making the grades. So please follow the conversation on Twitter. Uh, respond to us, ask questions, be snarky. We'll, we'll engage with the conversation that way. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of context about how this event came about. Um, Eric Laram at Students First actually approached us about whether we would be interested in hosting a conversation about these state policy report cards that every organization seems to be putting out these days. And I jumped at the opportunity, and I really think one of the reasons that Eric approached me about this, or I'd like to think this, is that I actually wrote something last year about their state policy report card when it first came out that was perhaps um, a little critical of the report card. You could characterize it that way. I said, it's appropriate for an organization centered around a policy agenda, like Students First, to produce rankings based on whether states have enacted those policies. That said, the only thing I learned from this report card was whether states had adopted Michelle Rhee's favorite education reforms. So in that spirit, I like to think that is why Eric approached us, because that's the sort of frank conversation I hope we can have today. Um, what do we really learn from these report cards? What do they tell us? What are we supposed to do with them? And particularly as more and more organizations have them, we're getting a lot of information about what's going on in states. And you know, that's sort of, states have been leaders in education reform over the last year, few years. The federal government hasn't been um, enacting much legislation lately. So a lot of what's happening really is at the state level. And are these report cards a way that we can follow it? Um, one of the things, though, that I wanted to make sure that we can have our conversation today, our debate, centered around what do we learn from these report cards, what do they really tell us, is that I didn't want to get the conversation bogged down in what is the methodology behind this, or how is Students First different from NCTQ and the fine points. So I kind of wanted to go over, first and foremost, um, just some of the high-level points to point out how these organizations are different, how their report cards reflect those differences, and just get a real sense of what we're talking about. Because when you say state policy report cards, it's a very different thing from Students First to NCTQ to Ed Week or any other organization that's producing these. Um, so our Making the Grades infographic, which hopefully all of you see online or picked up at the door, um, goes through some of these high-level differences. And um, it shows sort of Education Week's Quality Counts report on the left then NCTQ's State Teacher Policy Yearbook in the middle, and finally Students First State Policy Report Card on the right. Um, and you can see just from the get-go that on average states don't do very well. So I'm not sure what that says about education reform, but we clearly have a ways to go, that there's progress that all states can make. You know, the average grade is no higher than a C plus. Um, but that said, there are some high performers and some states that aren't doing so well, and they differ depending on what grading system you're looking at. Um, Florida per performs well on all of the rankings, actually. It's in the top 10 on all three. But if you look at you know, other states, there can be some extreme disparities. Washington, D.C. is in the top five on Students First. It's in the bottom 10 on Quality Counts for Education Weeks. So why is that? You know, and part of this is looking at what these organizations are actually considering. What, what subjects are we grading states on? So NCTQ, no surprise, being an organization that is very mission driven around promoting teacher effectiveness, is really looking at five categories all devoted to effective teachers, whether it's producing them, identifying them, retaining them. On the other hand, you have Editorial Projects in Education, which is producing Education Week's Quality Counts. And they have a much broader sp span of things that they're looking at. They're looking at a whole range of elements around standards-based reform. 
um, from Chance for Success, School Finance. They also look at teacher policies. Um, and you know, they're taking a, a different take. And at the same token, Students First, you know, they also have a broad agenda, a lot of different policies that they're promoting around um, improving student outcomes. They're not as sort of singularly focused on teacher effectiveness as NCTQ, and that is also reflected in what they're looking at. Another interesting thing to think about is sort of how long these report cards have been in existence. Education Week started nearly 20 years ago, before there was an NCLB, before standards-based reform had actually been enacted in federal policy. And so a lot of their uh, policies that they're looking at reflect that. Students First has only been grading states for two years. So their uh, policies and the points that they're looking at are more reflective, you could say, of the current wave of reform that many states are thinking about from school choice to teacher policy to parental information. Um, and finally, I think a point that's really just important to make is just that these organizations are different. You have, you know, Education Week is, you know, one of the most widely read education journalism outlets. It covers a wide range of topics. You know, everyone I think is reading Education Week on a daily basis. Um, or I don't know how you do this job if you aren't <laughs> sometimes. And, you know, that's reflected in maybe what the purpose of their rankings are. They're, they're not an advocacy organization in the same way that Students First or NCTQ is, where you know, they're really hoping to enact certain policies and making some real prescriptions about what states should be doing. So you know, I think that also is reflected when you look at the weighting within these uh, report cards. Students First and NCTQ both choose to weight some policies more than others because they feel that they're more important looking at their mission, their values. So to do a little bit of a rundown, just again to, to get at what we're talking about when we say Florida gets a B or you know, Montana is failing, it, it's different if you're talking about Education Week or NCTQ or Students First. Um, Education Week is the only one of these three that is considering things like student outcomes and the out of school factors. You know, they are looking at data like poverty and employment rates in a state, average income, and that's a real distinction from the other two. NCTQ, again, is very focused um, on all of these teacher effectiveness policies from preparation through in-service supports for teachers and retention policies. And you know, they have just as many criteria as some of the others, but they're only focused on those, those uh, three components. And so they're a lot more specific there. Uh, Students First is distinctive. They're the only organization that's really focusing on school choice um, and a way that's much more um, focused than the, the other two. So if you're seeing a state do well on one or another, it's reflective of what they choose to include. Um, so I hope that this sort of drive-by a little bit of what's in the grades uh, just provides some context for today's discussion and we can really start to get at, you know, now that we know what we're grading and how we're grading, you know, what should we do with this? That's really the question. Um, what, is the, what is the value of these report cards? What is their purpose? And you know, how should we take this information to make better policy? Um, does the purpose depend on who the audience is? Is it helpful for the public to know sort of just the general state of education reform? Is it helpful for policymakers that are looking to tackle some of their big education challenges? Um, are they, you know, sort of so, so specific sometimes that they're maybe oversimplifying the challenge, you know, ignoring some things when they shouldn't be? Um, and these are some of the questions that I hope that we can tackle today. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and introduce our panelists because I want to jump right into the discussion. We have a great panel here um, and I'm really, really excited, so I'll ask them to come up. Um, while I'm just giving their introductions, and this is going up as well. So if y'all want to come on up. Um, so Andy Smerick is our fabulous moderator today. Um, you probably know him at, at Smerick on Twitter, if you're not following him. Gave you a little shout out. Um, he's, he's a partner. Me, at yes. Smerick. At Smerick. <laughs> um, he's a partner at Bellwether Education Partners in their policy and thought leadership practice. And before that, he was the deputy commissioner of education for New Jersey. So he has actually been on the other side of this as a state policymaker. Um, and a lot of his work now revolves around 
uh, school turnarounds, the SIG program, Andy's favorite, uh. um, as well as sort of district reform and governance. And um, next to uh, Andy, we have Chris Swanson. Chris is a vice president for research um, at the Editorial Projects and Education, or Education Week, and previously has been at the Urban Institute. But Chris is sort of the man behind Quality Counts, um, as well as Technology Counts and Diploma Counts, these great research resources that Education Week produces every year and that we all rely on to figure out what's happening in states. Um, next to Chris, we have Sandy Jacobs, who's Vice President and Managing Director for State Policy at NCTQ, the National Council on Teacher Quality, um, and she's the driving force behind their state policy yearbook. Previously, she was at the U.S. Department of Education as a Senior Education Program Specialist for Reading First, as well as the Comprehensive School Reform Demonstration Programs, and she's previously taught that was her past, her past life, was teaching for almost a decade in um, public school nine in Brooklyn, New York. And she's also a founding core member of Teach for America. So. Old, so I'm old. No. <laughs> I, wise, I think, right? And experience. Um, experience. And finally, we have Eric Laram. He's the vice president for national policy at Students First um, and has been working uh, with Michelle Rhee out in Sacramento, but really thinking of their national at the national level. Prior to that, he was chief of staff to the deputy mayor for education here in Washington, DC, playing a lead role in their race to the top application, um, their school reform efforts here around teacher evaluations, um, and previously uh, was a lawyer, or was thinking about being a lawyer, and made the wise decision to instead do policy. So we have that to, to be grateful for. So with that, I'm also going to sit down and we'll turn it over to Andy. <laughs> So hi everyone, how are you? It's great to see such a big crowd uh, for a snowy Wednesday. I believe that moderators moderate best when they moderate least. So uh, a success measure for this, maybe we can have a report card for it, is how little I talk. Um, I think will be the, the key here because you're here to hear them. Um, I have been a consumer of these kinds of reports. I've worked for five government agencies now, so I'm often looking at these to see how my uh, little organization is stacking up. Um, but I've also been on the other side, kind of researching um, and producing stuff like this. So hopefully I'll be able to add a little bit of color here. Um, but no more throat clearing for me. Oh, I should say making the grade hashtag. Making the grade. Making the grades with an S at the end. Um, if you're out there watching this or in the audience, you can tweet that in. Send us questions and uh, they will get up to me and we'll get into the bloodstream. So uh, let's just kick this right off. Um, the senior... Uh, per, uh, 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 report card on the panel, let's say. So Chris, can I just ask like straight away, um, why did you guys decide to do this at first? And if you don't mind talking a little bit about the evolution of how it's different today than when it was at the beginning. Sure, th that'd be great. And uh, thanks Anne and New America Foundation for hosting this. This is a great discussion. Um, I, I was struck by the kind of report card of the report cards up there because Ed Week looks like an easy grader and I can assure you that's not how we're usually viewed by the states. Um, but Education Week has been around for 18 years. We just published our, or, uh, Quality Counts just published our 18th issue of the report in January. Um, the history of this is interesting. So Education Week is a nonprofit news organization. Um, we are, you know, kind of very kind of mindful of our objectivity and we're not an advocacy organization. We're a news organization. That doesn't mean we're disinterested. That doesn't mean we don't care. That doesn't mean we don't try to kind of improve the conversation to improve schools, but we don't have particular policies or, you know, kind of objectives in that kind of sense. That's just the kind of organization we are. But in the mid to late 90s, as, as folks may recall um, from history books, if nothing else, um, there was kind of a new wave of reform that was really starting to take hold. Standards-based reform, it seems so old now, but you know, at that time it was fairly new. Not that pieces of what became standards-based reform hadn't been around for some time, testing, kind of early forms of standards, other types of policy, but they were starting to kind of come together in a more coherent kind of movement and kind of a nationwide initiative than had been the case before. And, you know, again, in the, in the mid-90s, education was not the national kind of field and conversation that it is today. Um, when Education Week started in 1981, um, there are a lot of people who were scratching their heads, who cares about a national newspaper in education? It's such a local issue. There's no national conversation to be had. And I think that's obviously changed very much over time. Um, and education, or quality counts, I think, is an interesting kind of milestone along that way because we saw all this policy activity happen. This was a lot of state-led activity. Um, 
and you'd hear a little bit here, you'd hear a little bit there. You knew that there was a lot going on, but it was hard to kind of put your finger on kind of who was doing what and exactly how much of this was going on. And people in the field started kind of saying to themselves, well, somebody should really be tracking this to you know, see what's going on so states can learn from one another, um, just so we can be a, a more informed field, kind of really have a national dialogue about these issues. And Education Week raised their hand. And this was a, a very big departure for Education Week and our kind of um, you know, kind of former president at the time, you know, saw it as a real, you know, kind of departure from Education Week in some ways. You know, we had not been in the report card business. This was the first really major research project we'd undertaken. Um, but kind of we as a news organization that cares about the field saw it as something important. And so even today, I think when you look at the structure um, of kind of what we grade on as part of our report card, you see the legacy or kind of, you know, the fingerprints of those issues. You know, standards assessment accountability is something we've tracked from the beginning. We've looked at teacher-related policy from the beginning and some of these other categories. Um, you know, and so there is kind of a kind of through line that we see throughout these 18 years. Um, that being said, um, as we track those issues over time, one of the things that we saw that the field saw um, is that there was real movement. Um, what had been a fairly kind of new approach to kind of, you know, kind of statewide standards really took hold. Um, it got, you know, of course, a lift with No Child Left Behind, and, you know, which effectively mandated some of the types of state-led policies we've been tracking at that point um, for a decade. Um, you know, and so kind of we see the need to evolve all the work we do. We kind of approach our reporting in Education Week you know, with the idea that we need to serve the education audience with the information it needs in the way they need. Quality Counts is a little bit like that, although it's been around for a while. Um, it has evolved, and so if you look back at the earliest version of the report, and I kind of pulled that out of the file cabinet this morning, uh, one thing that strikes you is it's about this big. It's about 230 pages long, and the report has shrunk over time to really kind of concentrate what we're looking at. Um, and while some of the things we looked at, you know, 18 years ago are still around in some form or another, some are not, and that reflects just the change in the field and how we approach identifying what we think are the most important policy trends to watch. Um, we don't follow particular policies because we think schools and states need to do them. Um, we kind of cast a broad net through our own kind of research and reporting, just our ears to the ground. We tap into experts to get a sense for kind of what seems promising. We don't make claims that any of these policies are effective with a capital E or, you know, uh, kind of scientifically based. Um, if we did that, then the report would be about this small because there's so little kind of really solid, you know, kind of blue ribbon, gold star so research, you know, on policy, it's a lot trickier to connect the ABC than a lot of people probably think. Um, but these are the policies that we think are important. They're starting to take hold. There's a lot of promise. And so we have seen evolution um, over time. You see that within some of these categories that have remained around, whether it's kind of standards or teaching policy that have been around for a long time. Um, periodically, we'll, you know, kind of revisit. We'll look at, you know, the areas within them. Reports like NCTQs kind of, you know, were the kind of things that have informed our thinking over time when we look at a particular area like teacher policy, for example. One of the things that kind of Ann noted at the beginning is that when you look across these three report cards at least, um, Education Week is the only one that grades on kind of achievement related categories and some, we call them kind of data, find that you know, there's a kind of a lump of those categories. We've got three categories or six categories, three are policy related, three are not policy related and achievement falls into that category. Um, and that was a deliberate decision on our part. And I guess it was about 2008 we made kind of a fairly significant kind of shift in restructuring of the report. What had been kind of exclusively a policy-based report where we actually didn't issue summative grades, overall grades. Um, you know, we had you know, took stock like we do every now and then. And it, this is in part based on kind of feedback from the field and advisors. Um, the feeling was that by not focusing on the, more of the outcomes and context side of the ed education P, uh, world, we are missing an important kind of component. Policy is an important component. Outcomes are a component. What helps to make those policies work um, is important. So we kind of broadened the scope of it a little bit. We added an achievement category. We added something we call chance for success, which is much broader than that. And we continue to look at finance, which we have from the beginning. Um, so that's yeah, so it's evolved in interesting ways over time. You'll see that you would have seen a little asterisk on the uh, graphic up there, noting that you know some of the categories we have were updated this year and some were not updated this year. We're actually in the middle right now of one of these kind of periodic rethinkings we, we do um, related to how we kind of approach quality counts. And so we, we've suspended our policy survey work and there's, 
without getting into kind of nitty gritty of kind of methodology, and I'll just kind of make the point maybe kind of folks would be interested in following this up later. Um, I, think it, I think it's important for the kind of education public to have some understanding of kind of how the data comes about, kind of where it comes from, what sort of processes behind it, without getting into, well, this you know, indicator is the one I would look at, not this one. Um, but so we're, we're in one of those phases right now. And so part of the context is obviously you know, Common Core and everything that's been kind of coming along with that. I think a lot of state and federal policy, for that matter, is either kind of in stasis or in flux. And you know, as we kind of think about what it means to kind of be a state with kind of strong st approach to standards or assessment or accountability in 2014, 2015, um, it's not going to be the same as it was in 1997. Um, but it's not kind of clear to us quite yet, you know, kind of what we'd want to focus on for the next five to ten years. And so that's kind of where we are now, and that's something that's um, probably more or less visible to some people. But it's something that kind of we do and kind of that we take seriously as a way for quality counts as it moves forward to keep on kind of, you know, giving attention to those issues we think will help inform the field. So Chris's presentation was so good, I had four follow-up questions potentially to ask him, and he answered all four already. <laughs> So I'm moving on. Um, uh, Sandy, uh, uh, two questions. First of all, when you think about your report, who is your primary audience? Like who are you trying to influence? And then I want to talk about uh, what success looks like. So if I were a funder, some foundation, and you needed more money to keep this going, and you asked for money to uh, do new additions, and I would say, OK, how do I know that this thing is succeeding, that's having an impact? How would you answer? Yeah, so um, our report has been around for seven years. We just released our seventh edition um, this fall. And um, when we started doing this work, we, we didn't think about it as a report card at all. Um, the very first edition had scores for the individual goals, but it didn't have an overall grade. It sounds similar. That way you kind of realize um, over time that, that there's a, a need for that. Um, but our original goal wasn't so much to rank and rate the states as it was to provide a blueprint for reform. And, and that's really what we think the yearbook is. Um, you know, we're issuing something that's 150 pages per state. It's not just um, a snapshot of, of where, what we think a state's performance is in a certain area. It's sort of a, a detailed um, analysis and set of recommendations on, on how we think um, this policy could be better and, and better serve teachers and students. So um, over time, I mean, it's certainly correct to call it a report card, but, um, but we really do think of it as that, that blueprint for reform. Um, we don't hide at all the fact that the things we're looking at are goals. We call them goals, um, especially when we started doing them. Very few states were, were meeting the goals. Um, we, it's a reform framework. Um, and, and we're pretty straightforward about that. Um, one of the things that we incorporate into the report that um, I really value is we, we send the draft out to the state and we ask for their feedback. And for each of the goal, this year there were 31 of them, we, we print the state's comments for each and every goal. So there's a little bit of a dialogue there. There are states who wholeheartedly disagree with our recommendations. Um, and, and the way the goal is framed itself, and we include that in the report. We, we think that's an important part, um, important part of the conversation. Uh, our, our primary audience is policymakers. We, we are trying um, to give policymakers a blueprint, a roadmap. Um, I've heard it called different things in different states, mostly positive things. Um, but that, that, that they can use. We're, we're trying to show states examples of what other states are doing that we think is, is good, strong policy to really emphasize those best practices. Um, I think when we started doing this, there were some places where states were truly shocked to see that anybody was doing these kinds of things. Yep. They would have told you with 100% truthfulness that you know 50 states do not have the policy that you're suggesting, but that generally wasn't the case. Um, and as we've seen more and more states shifting, I think there are states that continue to be surprised as maybe once they were in the majority of states and now they're in the minority of, of where they stand. Um, but we also try to include, um, I think the, the edition that came out in January had about 125 tables in it. So even if you're not interested in our scores, you're not interested in our ratings, um, for any policy area you can get the lay of the land, you know, which states require annual evaluations and which states don't, you might not 
agree that annual evaluations is a worthy goal, but you can see the, how, how, states, um, how states fall out around that. So as far as how we assess our progress, I mean, the beauty of a report card is itself. <laughs> it, you, know, you, have, uh, it's, you have ways to compare from year to year uh, pretty, pretty clearly. Um, the most exciting thing for us has been the change over the last few years. States have put a lot of emphasis on, on teacher policies. Um, it, it might maybe looked from that infographic like we were, you know, um, uh, our, our average being a C minus maybe isn't that much to write home about. But when the first time we gave grades in 2009, that average was a D. And when we did it in 2011, it was uh, a D plus. And so now it's, it's C minus. We see, you know, real steady progress here. And um, that incremental uh, progress on the, on the average, you know, really doesn't tell the story about how many states have made leaps and bounds uh, kind of progress on, on these, um, on these issues. In, in 2009, we didn't give a single B. Uh, in 2011, we gave four Bs, and this year we gave 14 Bs. So the, the, the field is, is really shifting very dramatically. So as far as showing um, the public, you know, uh, the, the F, you know what, what the results are, it, it's, that's fairly <laughs> straightforward to, to be able to do. Yeah. And, and while the primary audience is policymakers, we don't think that's the only audience by, by any stretch. Um, I think teachers in, in states are increasingly um, interested in, in the policy framework. Um, I think there are things that, that uh, govern their lives that they don't know are dictated at the state level. I think they think a lot of those decisions happen locally. Um, in many cases, it's just the implementation that happens locally, but, it, but it's really at, at the state level. And I think you know, the, the public at large, um, I don't know that they want to know the you know, nitty gritty of a state's licensure policy for any specific kinds of teacher, um, but I think they are generally interested in, in teacher effectiveness and, and making sure kids have high quality teachers. Thank you. Uh, remember, hashtag making the grades if you want to throw in questions. Um, I, there's a point that I want to come back to at the end, and it is this interesting link between there can be a difference in making advances in policy and making advances in student achievement. And you pointed that out at the beginning, and I want to press some of you guys on that um, later on, but given that it was brought up twice, I thought I would highlight it. The question for you, Eric, is it's obvious that these reports have um, external value, like they inform and hopefully uh, adjust people. But I want to talk about what it actually does for your organization internally. So can you talk somewhat about um, how the report card helps you align the work that you do and then how you hold yourselves accountable for actually, I assume you want a state to move from an F to a C or a C to an A. So how are you organized um, and how does this report help you go about doing that work? Sure. Um, so yeah, so you know, we're a national advocacy organization. We focus on, and our primary mission right now is changing laws and policies in states. We want to move from you know, sort of the, the education environment we have in most states to a more stu student-centered approach. Um, we want to base it on you know, key, uh, key elements or key levers for reform uh, around elevating the teaching profession, teacher quality, choice, um, and accountability and, and spending. Um, for us, what we've what we found is that while we started this as a as you know sort of an overall goal of, of raising awareness, generating conversation about the policy, a lot of the things that, that Sandy talked about um, in, in terms of being able to drive that conversation, we have been able to uh, really take a step back and as an organization orient our state-based work, our advocacy efforts uh, around exactly those goals of taking a state, you know, looking at their GPA where they are currently, and then using that to frame. Uh, the discussion, use that as a roadmap when we go to policymakers to say, look, this is, this is what you can improve this year, this is what you can improve in the next two years, three years, um, and we want to move your state's grade up, we want to move your GPA. Uh, when we started, uh, you know, last year I think there were 14 Fs, uh, states that, that received F grades, this year I think we're down to seven, so we're seeing, uh, you know, as, as Sandy mentioned, the policy change is moving in the right direction. We want to be able to track that over time and eventually you know, move uh, you know, at least a, a tipping point of states to the right place in terms of the policy environment. I think it, when we think about a lot of the factors that the Education Week um, report card measures, for example, 
really digging deeper into the policy piece, I think, is important because at the end of the day, policy really matters. I think it helps explain what's going on there um, in terms of, of why you have the student outcomes you have. And I think it also helps explain what a state is doing about it. And when you look at achievement across the whole country and in, in, in any state, um, I, I, it's hard to argue that it's not you know, just abysmally low, uh, in most places unacceptably low at best in any state um, in terms of overall achievement, in terms of achievement gaps. So peeling that back, looking at the policies and thinking about you know, why that is and what we can change um, to, to change those outcomes I think is important. For us as an organization, you know, setting our goals at, at each uh, state, looking at um, you know, our, our current year's plan and then our five-year plan, how are we going to move the states up through the, through the, um, the GPA, the grade, the ranking, um, that, that becomes really the, the, the primary focus for us. That's great. Uh, and I'm going to want to ask you a question about like, the research angle about this, but I want to just press on one issue uh, for a moment here. There is a difference between correlation and causation. So it could be the case that these policies are getting better and they would have gotten better had you guys never put out your report cards, had your organizations not actually existed. So I had a professor once who always lectured me, data is not the plural of anecdote. Um, so I'm going to go back on that actually here uh, because I think anecdotal evidence might be the best thing that we have uh, in this area. So can you point to us, like give us a couple examples of how you think either your report card or your advocacy that went along with your report card actually changed behavior, changed the policy, changed the statute, changed the governor's view? Well, I mean, we, we have many examples of that because we've worked directly with states who've, who've you know, called us up as a result of the yearbook and said, you know, we want to do this to, you know, walk us through the steps. So, so we have loads of examples. And, and there are plenty of other places where it's like, oh, look, that state passed that, where y you don't know whether you had, uh -huh. you brought it to their attention or whether it was already on, on their radar. But we've seen, um, I, I won't mention the state name, um, but when we, f early on, um, there was a state that had in its um, regs that for teacher licensure tests, um, if you were within a standard deviation of the cut score, that would be okay. Now, th right, that's then you don't really have a cut score. You have a cut score that's a standard <laughs> deviation below what you're claiming the cut score is. And, and we made kind of a big fuss about that because it just seemed so egregious. And that policy went away almost immediately after we published that. Again, I, I can't tell you there was causation there, but it seems pretty clear that you know when you call out a state on something that's almost indefensible, they they pay attention and and act. And we, you, we have lots of anecdotes like that. I'm sure you do as well. Yeah, I mean, I, and like Sandy, I won't I won't name names on states because I don't want to call them out. But I think they're you know legislators are are can be a bit competitive, um, particularly in regional situations. And so you'll have legislators in one state they're paying attention to what other states are doing. If they want to move education policy, if they want to be seen as leaders in this field. Um, they're, they're paying attention. And so, uh, and, and I think one of the benefits of grading states rather than, than simply describing the policy but actually assigning a score is that we will then have legislators who will ask not only what do we need to do, what type of policy do we need to pass, but they're paying attention as we are to the strength and rigor of the policy. Well, you know, this is going to take me sort of halfway up your grade. What do I need to do to get the full, full grade? What, am I, what are all the elements of the policy? And then, and then go back and you know, amend the bill, put that in there. And that's something that, that we're able to focus on um, with our state teams. Again, we, because we want the, the GPA to go up as much as possible, it's not enough to just put a teacher evaluation and pol policy uh, in place. We want it to be the strongest teacher evaluation policy we can get. Um, and and you know, being able to talk to, that, uh, to talk to policymakers about that, being able to talk to our members and our advocates on the ground so that they can push for the stronger policy, um, we, we've definitely seen it make a difference. And I, I would agree. I think having that overall grade or score, or kind of whatever your particular you know, kind of rubric is, I think it makes a difference. It makes a difference in lots of ways, you don't, I think none of us want to boil it down to a horse race where we kind of want to see who's on first and second and all that. Um, but from our perspective, you know, for example, with, with quality counts, you know, the overall grade is kind of a way to kind of get an audience that's interested in education policy at a certain level kind of further into the conversation. We've got over 100 indicators kind of across all of our framework. That's too much for anybody to keep in their mind all at one time, including myself, right? Um, and so kind of that overall grade kind of gets people hooked and it kind of pulls them in to get more information 
Um, and if you are a state legislator, or if you're kind of uh, kind of state chief, or you know, um, or kind of otherwise in a leader policy leadership position in a state, you have kind of an incentive to kind of know what's going on. Um, I think these are. You don't want kind of states to kind of want to rise up the rankings for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've gotten plenty of questions like that over the years. I'm, I'm sure other folks who've done similar types of projects have, where you know, a, somebody from a state will say, you know, we want to raise our state finance grade a little bit, or you know, what if we had this, what would it do to our grade? And we're, you know, it's not our goal for states to kind of rise up the rankings. We're kind of more objectively kind of tracking state activity in these areas as well as some of the other outcomes. So that's kind of a, a, maybe a little cynical kind of reason that states might do it. But you know, cause, uh, as we've already heard, especially um, projects that kind of get into real depth, you know, much more than we do in kind of particular areas, um, states really do want to know what's going on. They often look to these kind of um, reports as not just you know, kind of which way is the wind blowing, but especially the more detailed ones, kind of what's best practice or what's you know, really you know, kind of taking hold. And that's where they learn about these things. They can talk to their colleagues here and there, um, but I think there's you know, no substitute for a kind of systematic 50-state look at those types of issues. Yeah. So Anne raised a really interesting point in uh, her introduction about, uh, she put <laughs> a very direct language about uh, effectively the uh, student source report card being a what laundry list of Michelle Reeves' favorite policies, something along those lines. Um, but there's a very important kernel there. That is um, the majority of indicators, I think, in Education Week and Quality Counts, and all of the indicators in the other two are what we would refer to as inputs not outputs. Um, how do we think about that as like researchers? I mean, it could be the case that, um, say, five years from now, that the states that uh, progress the most on NCTQs and student source report cards, um, say they all went from Fs to As, but not a single one of them had better student achievement. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the real question, and that's sort of the gamble that we're taking with these report cards is that we you know, you can sort of say, this is what we think. Chris mentioned, like, you know, your report card could be this long if you say what you think might be a good idea, and this long if you actually included only things that had, you know, really valid evidence-based research behind them, um, you know, to the gold standard that maybe, like, a What Works Clearinghouse would use or something. So, you know, I think that's something that you'd have to watch. For me as a researcher, and I'm purely a consumer of these rankings, so kind of coming from a different perspective, you know, I recognize how much work goes into this. Um, 50 or 51 state uh, surveys it takes a ton of time and resources, and I'm so appreciative that they're doing it and not me. Because if I'm you know, trying to write something, you know, looking at NCLB waivers and teacher evaluation policies, you know, do I really want to go look at every state's waiver every day? No, I really don't. But I can go to NCTQ's yearbook and sort of have that data point and pull it out on and sort of as, a, as another source of information. Or I can go to Education Week and pull the data for an individual state um, on any of these given topics. And as Sandy was mentioning too, you know, there's not just an aggregate report. A lot of times there's also a very state specific report. So if you're really wanting to get information about a particular state, it's also a really helpful resource for me. Um, to the bigger question though of sort of is there going to be a disconnect, perhaps, between these policies and then what happens with student achievement? I think that that's a risk, but I think um, you know it's something that sort of is up to people like me who are on the outside to be writing about and pressing on. And anytime you know I'm looking to think about, well, are our teacher evaluation reforms are they working? Um, that's obviously a question you guys are looking at too. It's not like you're just grading states. Um, you know, I'm might look at what NCTQ's data are, but I'm also going to be needing to pull outside sources of data. You know, I think when, when you're grading states, you pick and choose. You're, you're not including everything. You, that would be impossible. Um, and so there are certain things that aren't going to be included in this, and I think we need to consider that as researchers. You know, what, what data do we need? Are we actually collecting that data? Um, does the Department of Education have it? Do state departments of education have it? And if they don't, I think we need to press them to do a better job of collecting, collecting that, and then you know we'll we'll see. And I would say you know one thing that's um, you know despite my cynical uh, blog post about students first, one of the things that I think is great about all the th three of these report cards is that they do actually reflect 
um, you know, new research that comes out, changing conditions, you know, new laws. So, you know, students first this year, I think I called you out last year perhaps on the teacher evaluation side of things and said, why do you have to have um, student test scores be 50% of a teacher evaluation? The MET project report just came out and it said there's a range of reasonable rates, weights. It could be 33% to 50%, you know, why are you being so specific? And this year, the report card changed. So I think that it's great when you're listening to sort of the research field that's coming out and changing um, how you grade. Your goals have increased over the years, Sandy, as states have you know, gotten further down the path of these reforms. You've changed what um, you know, counts for an A. The goals have gotten higher. Um, yeah, and I, I think an important thing to underscore is, right, we, we could have graded on a curve from the beginning. You could have graded on a curve from the beginning and um, told the same underlying pos policy story with, with a different message to it. And I think because, because the goal was do things differently, you, you're not helping anyone do that by saying, well, you know, you're the, you're the top and so we're going to give you an A, even though you have a lot of room yeah. for improvement underneath. Right. Yeah, the problem in education is we've been grading on a curve for a really long time. Um, look, I, I think the, the framing that you mentioned in your question is interesting, Andy, and if I can answer to, to Anne's critique as well, I think, you know, this idea of uh, policy being the input and should we focus on outputs, I think it's a fair question, but in my mind, policy may be the most important input we can measure. Um, and, and, and I'll give you two quick examples, neither of which will deal with teacher quality because uh, I'm sitting next to too big of an expert on it. But uh, you know, if, we, if we want to talk about what states are spending and how much they're spending per student and say you know, we, we lay out that, that X state is spending $13,000 per student, we need to be asking the question about what are the policies in place, what are the parameters, the strings that the states attach to that funding and how much of that goes down to the school level if we hope to have any sort of understanding whatsoever of, of what that funding actually does for kids. Because if we're sending you know, $13,000 is coming from the state, but only you know, uh, $9,000 of it uh, reaches the schoolhouse, and of that $9,000, I don't know, uh, you know, 7,000, 8,000 is already spoken for by, by you know, sort of different restrictions uh, from the state, from the district in terms of policy, how that, district, or how that school leader can spend those dollars, those become incredibly important questions that if we don't answer, trying to compare states and the, the dollars they're spending really becomes meaningless. Likewise, if, uh, you know, I thought Education Week's theme this year around uh, the changing nature of governance in districts and really thinking about how the district definition is changing. And a lot of things that you're interested, Andy, around uh, districts that are using charter schools as, as more and more of a tool within the district. Uh, we should be asking ourselves whether or not those charter schools are receiving uh, a comparable share of the resources, whether they have access to facilities. Because if, if this is an increasing trend, if districts are looking to this as a model, because autonomy brings certain benefits, but we're not making sure the policies are in place to make sure those schools can be successful because those public school students receive the same types of resources. If we're not asking those questions, again, I don't know what we're going to actually see on the back end of, of, uh, in terms of success. So these are important questions that, that you know, hopefully this type of report card lays out. And I would say that thinking about policy and achievement as kind of input, output, that's one way to look at it, but I think it's actually not the only way. And especially as you look at these issues over the long term, it's more complex than that. And I think we get an appreciation for this with Quality Counts because it's been around so long. Um, we looked at least kind of this contextually at achievement since the very first issue. We didn't grade on it for a long time, though. Um, but what you see, if you kind of dust off the history books and you remember what was going on in the kind of the you know, mid-90s, the really big push for these kind of policies, <coughs> standards-based policies, was coming from the South, right? There were a lot of governors in the, the southern part of the country who were kind of really kind of strong advocates for the, this approach. These are states that had historically low-performing schools and were looking to do something about it. So there's a little bit of a kind of chicken and egg sort of relationship here. If you look now, um, it, it's a little bit different, but it was actually kind of, you know, back and probably still today to some extent. Some of the states that are most aggressive on policy um, are also the lowest performing, and they're kind of looking at policy as a way to remedy that. Now, as you look, look at this over the longer haul, you can kind of take a more nuanced, you know, kind of perspective on it. And we don't do that. We actually have only, only done this once in the history of quality counts, taking a more, um, you know, kind of 
you know, intentional look at the relationship. I wouldn't call it, call it cause and effect between policy adoption and changes in achievement. We did that around the 10th anniversary of the report. Um, and it's very hard to do, and it's in my kind of academic background, you know, kind of prior to kind of doing what I do now, was kind of look, you being a kind of policy researcher, it's what did my dissertation on it. Um, <clears throat> and I, I'm kind of very kind of humble and modest about what you can actually accomplish through even really good policy research, just because the state policy environment is so complicated. You've got 50, 51 cases, which sounds like it's nice and manageable, but it makes it hard to sort out what's going on when states are doing 100 different things at the same time. And we saw some clear indications that certain types of policy were associated with gains and achievement over a kind of a period of about a decade. Um, but one of the other things that we've gotten appreciation for, especially more recently as we've been tracking kind of achievement in a more kind of systematic and intentional way, is it takes a long time for these things to, to take hold and to maybe show some um, kind of movement of the needle when you look at things like achievement. Um, and so if you look at kind of states in the South, it kind of Florida is actually a great example. Very strong on the policy side, especially around some of the types of policies we tend to track. Um, if you look kind of back at the kind of early days of Quality Council, it was a very low performing state. Um, you know, it's kind of moved its way up, so it's kind of about average, you know, for the nation. And that doesn't seem really great, but in the longer scheme of things, I think that's a real success story. And while I wouldn't kind of say, you know, causation with a big C is part of it, certainly kind of the policy environment in the state is part of the story. Um, and that's kind of for other folks to kind of who know, you know, the details on the ground a little bit better to figure out. Um, but it, it is a little bit more complicated than input and output at a particular point in time. And so I think that's one of the reasons it's kind of helpful to look at these over the long term. Makes sense. Uh, and we, we've also tried to focus on, you know, in the absence of clear research on some of these policies, we've tried to focus on things that just make good sense. You know, the idea that a teacher is going to go five or seven years without getting any feedback on her practice, it doesn't make any sense. And so saying, you know, teachers need feedback on their performance every year, it, it, you feel safe promoting that. When we look at you know, elementary licensure tests and the fact that most states were using a single composite score, that meant that a teacher in most cases could get every math question wrong and still pass the test. That doesn't make good sense. And so saying we need to make sure elementary teachers know all the subjects they're going to teach, you, know, you, you feel confident putting that forward. Yeah, and I actually have no problem with just the focus on policy. I think it's completely appropriate for these organizations. I am a policy analyst. I love thinking about policy and seeing what's happening. Um, and so I, I would say, though, as a researcher, it's the overall grades in particular are just not that useful to me. It's not that helpful for me to know that Florida is a B or a C or that you know, Mississippi got this, that grade. That's not really what I'm interested in. Um, that doesn't hook me to the rank, to the grades. It might get a policymaker's attention. It might get a governor's attention. It might get um, a journalist to write about the report that wouldn't if you just presented the data behind it. But um, for me, you know, the, just looking at the grades doesn't tell me much. I really am the person that's going and looking at the hundreds of pages behind it, um, and then figuring out, okay, now that we know this policy is happening, what does that tell us? Um, about the state of sort of policy reform and how could we figure out if these policies are working? You know, mm -hmm. maybe I can't do sort of a, a gold standard research study, but what could I do um, to sort of either show what's working or what isn't working and, and make some further recommendations, you know, as someone who's outside of the grading process? So I would like to open this to the audience and our uh, online folks. After one more question for me, I want to be as provocative as possible. Hopefully get some juices stirring here. So the policy wonk in me, uh, like the government bureaucrat, kind of looks at these grades and part of me just shakes my head and says, ugh, implementation, implementation, implementation. Um, so Rick Hess and Mike Petrilli famously wrote when they were writing something about NCLB that Uncle Sam can make states and districts do something, but he can't make them do it well. For example, uh, there was this policy on giving uh, kids in low-performing schools a choice, uh, going to some other school in the district or maybe even outside. And GAO ended up finding that only 2 3% of kids who were eligible actually got to exercise that choice. When I was a charter authorizer in uh, New Jersey, I know that we had the same statute the day I got there as when we left, but because we worked with NAXA, this organization that helps authorizers, our 
policy or practices on charter authorization went from awful to actually pretty darn good. Again, no change in policy, better change in implementation. Uh, similarly, we're seeing in some places that have changed their teacher eval laws that they're still getting the widget effect. There isn't this great uh, differentiation in the grades that teachers are actually getting. So what I want to ask all of you to reflect upon is um, who is doing research or should you guys do more research in your publications on the difference between what is uh, the cold letters and statutes and regulations and what is actually happening on the ground in implementation? Well, it's, it's certainly something that we've been thinking about since we started it. We've always viewed the policy report card as sort of the first step. Uh, the second phase of this, if you will, that I think you know, we're, we're thinking about whether we start doing it next year, or maybe the year after, and how we ramp it up, but is to go back and start to grade states on the implementation of the policy. Uh -huh. That's still stopping from the third phase of what are the results you're achieving, mm -hmm. but I think it, it, it would be interesting. It should be a, a critical analysis that we perform, that others perform, to look at, uh, you know, we passed this policy, what are the states doing to implement it? If you pass an evaluation policy, how many districts are implementing it? What do the, the models look like? Are they close to the state model or not? How are the numbers panning out in terms of how many teachers are evaluating, what's the range? All those are questions that we have to ask because you're right, implementation at the end of the day, uh, as much as policy matters, implementation probably matters a little more. And so, um, uh, but I still think that we're not even asking the implementation question until you, until you pass the policy. Um, Fair and, we, and we see a lot of states that frankly sit in stagnation because they're stuck on the questions around how do they implement or we can't get it perfect so therefore let's not quite pass the policy yet. You never you know, cross that threshold and start talking about the complexities of implementation until you have a policy uh, that, that you start to try and live by, I think. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's necessary uh, but no, no way sufficient to, to what you're trying to achieve. Um, you have to have the policy in, in place in, in order to move it forward. Um, I, we just, I, I don't even know how we would begin to track implementation um, at, at the level, um, the number of, of areas that we're looking at, um, you know, certainly from our offices in Washington, D.C., how, how we could do that, I, I just don't know. Um, we count a lot on the uh, local advocacy organizations taking our report about a certain state as a starting point and, and running with it and saying, you know, that these two things that we've given the state credit for, they are doing a terrible job with. And, and other things um, where there's the need for the policy push that, that they can push on, on that. I, I just absolutely agree of how important it is. And I would, I would agree. We see kind of the work we do in quality council is hopefully the beginning of a conversation and not the end. And we're realistic about what we can accomplish as an organization with like any organization limited resources. Um, you know, we focus on kind of policy, kind of adoption and enactment. And that's kind of, you know, how we kind of look at policy. As important as we kind of understand and kind of know implementation to be, we just don't have the resources or given the kind of breadth of what we look at, the kind of, you know, kind of knowledge and expertise to make more qualitative determinations that this is good implementation, this is not, this is halfway in between. That's kind of not where our strength lies, but whether it's local advocates who are big consumers of these reports within their state especially, um, or if it's other national organizations with a real specialty on teaching or, you know, kind of policies related to choice or whatever it happens to be, those are often, you know, kind of who takes these results and kind of using something like quality counts as a starting point will kind of dig deeper, will kind of build around kind of, you know, the basic information we're able to provide in the report. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I would say the, the same thing. Like, I think it's great. I don't know who could be the grader of implementation, but I think it's really important that we not just focus on policy adoption because I think sometimes, you know, and you've sort of shared some anecdotes of this, that it can kind of just become a policy adoption checklist, you know, teacher evaluations, check, school choice policy, check, and that doesn't always lead to thoughtful implementation, it can lead to really shallow implementation. Um, you know, getting reform to be implemented well you have to really be thinking about the timing of it, the sequencing of it. What should you do first? Should you try and do it all at once? Should you have a more ordered process? How do you get buy-in? Um, and you, you know, we see all the time what happens. You know, they're the best of intentions around policy, but an administration changes. You go from a Bloomberg to a de Blasio, and things change dramatically. Um, you know, or you go from a Tony Bennett to a Glenda Ritz. You know, what happens? when you have those shifts um, and a lot of times policy staying in place depends on 
how it was implemented and how deeply it's sort of taken root. Um, you know, regs can change, laws can change, and go back to you know what they were before. So, you know, it is difficult to grade implementation. But I think if we don't focus on it, you could just get a lot of sort of politicians or state legislators who are hoping to you know make a name for themselves. Just say, yeah, you know, look at look at what we did on this. You know, we went from a, a C to a B plus um, on this grade because of this bill that I passed. Um, and not really caring about how that's implemented um, and how it affects schools and educators. So I hope that someone can, can answer that question. I'm not sure if, it, if you all have the capacity to, but I think if we don't think about this, these sort of report cards can just become a distraction and you know, may not, then we may not see the results with, from these reforms that we would hope to see in the end. I was just checking uh, the feed here on Twitter and lots of interesting comments and uh, questions which I hope we'll get to. Uh, the thing about implementation seems to really have uh, struck a nerve with people, especially folks who are uh, sort of in the system. So sir, I think you uh, had a question? Oh, we have a mic coming. Oh, so. on its way. <laughs> Hi, my name's Dave Price and I started in school as a five-year-old in kindergarten and 56 years. I'm still there as a senior consultant. My question Two, two questions. Uh, first to uh, Sandy and Eric. Giving Montana and North Dakota an F, do you have any fear of driving through that state later that you'd be identified <laughs> as giving them that grade and you, your pictures might be there somewhere? Or you're pretty comfortable with that? Yeah, we've been, we've been giving Montana that grade for a, a while now. <laughs> yeah, um, we're, yeah, we're, we're, I, I think. And you I have think, no relatives there or yeah, they still I think speak we're, to you? We're okay with it. They also have high speed limits, so you That's can drive true. very fast. <laughs> very now, now here's, here's the more serious question. It's all five of you or any who care to answer. Uh, you could choose policy, you could choose implementation. If tomorrow, hypothetically, you could make one change to make education better for the most students in the most states. We understand it's different all over. What would that change be and why would you choose that one? I'm happy to go first or last. I mean, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I mean, everyone knows what my, my <laughs> spiel on this is, so why don't you guys go first? I'll go first, and this is just me talking and not Education Week or Quality Counts because we're not, not in that business, and this is just my own view. Um, I think we need a more sensible approach to assessment. Right. It just, as a researcher, I think we waste a lot of time and energy with assessments that are in some cases are bad, in some cases don't measure what students are learning or are supposed to be learning, and are just completely non-comparable with one another. It drives me crazy as a researcher that we don't have like good nationwide comparable measures of assessment that are good, that require you know, kind of real demonstration of not just kind of facts and figures, but kind of how students learn, and that, can, you know, that are kind of become part of an infrastructure that can drive policy that can um, help students as they're learning and not like, you know, maybe a couple years later, you know, once data finally gets out. Um, and that can really kind of be a backbone of kind of more integrated kind of curriculum and instruction and instructional intervention. Um, you know, this has been kind of tried, right? If you kind of go back to the 90s, I knew somebody kind of very well in the 90s who was working in the department, U.S. Department of Education, and he was tasked with trying to promote the, what was at that point the voluntary national test. That didn't go anywhere. You know, under kind of the, the common core and the common assessments, we've made a lot more progress. We're not there yet. We'll kind of see what happens. Um, but I, I, I think we just kind of waste a lot of time and effort kind of as a field. And it, it you know, the, just the way we, it, the balkanized approach to assessment, I think is in very little people's interest right now. So I obviously have to give a teacher answer, right? I'm the National Council on Teacher Quality. And I think, um, having the, the ability to identify teacher performance and teacher effectiveness is, is just absolutely central and, and connects to almost everything else. Um, you know, how we prepare teachers to how we compensate them, how we provide professional development that, that's um, to, to teachers' benefit and students' benefit. Um, you know, almost everything that we include in the yearbook you know, if you put the teacher effectiveness measure at the center, it, it would connect out to it. So I, I think that, that and, and being able to do it well and right and get real differentiation uh, of, of performance um, to, you know, so that everybody can grow and help, uh, grow and develop and improve so that we know who our superstars are so that we use them really well and that we do something about, you know, chronic underperformers as well. Yeah, it's tough for me because I pick you know, one. I know I'm gonna pick one. I'm not gonna fight the hypothetical. So I would agree with with Sandy um, on the teacher quality piece. Uh, 
a huge choice component, uh, proponent, but every time I go into any type of school, whatever type it is, what I'm walking away from is always thinking about the instruction that I saw in the teachers and, and you know, to the extent it's a charter school, they, what did their autonomy enable them to do in terms of the, the environment they created for teachers? And, and you know, this equity question that continually comes up, we're talking about you know, our students with our greatest needs, what sort of resources are they getting? To me, the most important question we should be asking there is why you know, our kids with our great, the, the greatest needs aren't getting our very best teachers and what policies are prohibiting that from happening. Um, so I, yeah, I gotta go back to teacher quality as well. Yeah, it's, this is a very tough question, and I think one of the things, I mean, it sort of maybe my answer touches on some of the things that others have, have talked about, but I think that I would really like for us to actually be able to know um, through better data, through better assessment data, but not just on the assessment side, you know, what resources and opportunities students actually have at the school level. Because I think right now we, give m much better support, much better resources to the schools that, you know, are, are better resources to begin with, are already at an advantage. You know, we actually don't know how bad our equity gaps are, our resource gaps are, our access gaps are. And I think a lot of these questions about, well, what should we do about it, you, you can't even start to begin to answer that question unless you, you have the data. So part of it is the assessment data, but it's also, you know, actually looking at school level budget data. We don't have that. We don't actually know how much different schools have um, when you look at their teachers and their and, and different resources. So I think that that's something I would like to see and I think could actually like spur a lot of great conversation about better targeting our interventions to where they're needed. So my answer is more governance related. I'm struck by the fact that every state constitution not only uh, empowers but gives the responsibility of delivering a public education uh, that responsibility is at the state level. So that's when we have adequacy and equity lawsuits. The state is the one that is sued. But in every single state, the state has made the decision to delegate that responsibility to these things we call districts. Um, in the words of uh, Ted Coldery, we gave the exclusive territorial franchise of public education to these geographic entities. And in urban areas, they've been failing our kids for at least half a century. And so the fact that we have a governance model that isn't working for tens of millions of poor kids, I find offensive. What I find interesting and really encouraging is over the past 20 years, we have gotten away from that. First, it was with chartering, saying that non-district entities could run schools. More recently, we have the RSD and the ASD in uh, Louisiana and Tennessee, respectively, where the state said, yeah, these uh, geographic districts aren't working. We're going to have a statewide district that can create schools or take over schools. And we're seeing increasingly, like in Camden, maybe in Kansas City, where the state is going to take over a district and do something different with it. Uh, so I think we might be on the cutting edge of solving a century-long problem where the state abrogated its duty to really deliver a great public education to every child. Um, so let's, uh, do you have any good Twitter questions you'd like to surface for us? Uh -huh. Yeah, please. What I noticed from Twi Twitter is uh, most of you guys are commenting more than asking questions, which we appreciate. Um, so this is Deborah. I, I agree that policy is easier to analyze, but how do we know we're looking at the right policies? How do we know what matters most? Start, no, start uh, on the teacher piece. Uh, I mean, from <laughs> our point of view, we, we've tried to be comprehensive. We, we've tried to include everything we can think of that, that is a policy at the state level that, that impacts the teaching profession. That's why we have um, 31 uh, goals. So we, we have tried not to exclude anything. Um, how we set those goals is, of course, you know, our, um, our priorities. Um, but I think we do see over time, you know, when you see uh, 30 states shifting in, in some areas and not other areas, like you have to ask, well, maybe this isn't just a, isn't as important, and and start to think about it that way. And we we have thought about that in terms of how how things uh, are prioritized. But um, you know, uh, and this is in no way to to be critical. We we have the luxury of being really comprehensive because we're trying to go deep on on one issue. I I, I don't know how you do that uh, more broadly because it would be a thousand page report right. just just on a single state um, we and and we worry the flip side is we worry because we are putting out 150 
pages per state that no one in the state wants to read 150 pages. So uh, you know, finding the, the sweet spot is, is very hard. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I mean, I think, I think we look at research and we look at facts on the ground and common sense and try and put together the best combination. I think the research is clear on the importance of the teacher in the classroom. So what policies uh, get us there to, to be able to put a great teacher in front of every kid? Uh, you know, uh, there are too many kids that are, that are uh, stuck without a better option because of, of you know, their, their family background, their zip code, whatever it is. So what policies increase their, their number of choices that are op uh, available? Make sure those are high quality choices. Uh, you know, just go down the, the, your, your piece around governance, I think is important. It's why we, we focus on governance as well. So, uh, you know, I think we, we focus on what we believe are the levers for reform, the, the policies that are going to create conditions in which educators and schools can can do better by our kids. Fritz, did you have a question? Um, we've talked a lot about the, the, the focus of the uh, two reports. Um, one, for researchers, because it gives information, and two, from the policy side, giving ideas. Going back in time, the, we've kind of referred to the, the grandfather of the thing being Ed Week, but it goes back even further to the NGA reports on states when Mike Cohn was running the NGA side of it, or when Ted Bell was secretary and did the first report card, which people probably forget. But the question I want to ask has to do with making a difference. In each of the reports, we talk about how it values the researcher or pointing out policy. But have, has anybody gone and looked at the reports and what difference it's made in states as a result of pointing out lack of policy or lack of practice and lack of implementation? And if you haven't, is that on the radar screen? Yeah, I mean, for us, again, our, our starting objective here was to create awareness and then you know, use that as a roadmap for dialogue for change. And I think that, that we have seen that. And this is anecdotally. We haven't done a study on it or anything. But, but it is definitely playing out in the states that we're working in and even states that we're not working in where folks are talking about this. And so the awareness piece is, is sort of checked off because suddenly we're having conversations about these policies. We're having conversations about the state's grade. To the extent it makes a difference is because I think it, you know, it needs to be aspirational. We want states to, uh, to, to want to change. And, and even a state like you know, Massachusetts, when we put out our, our report card last year, Massachusetts always does well in the Ed Week rankings. I think people sort of take for granted that they have the best education environment. And yet we had you know, an, uh, an op-ed by uh, you know, uh, legislators on both sides of the house saying, you know what, we do OK in Massachusetts, but it's time to change. There's a lot more that we can do. Um, and this policy report card points out that there are a lot of areas where we're just not keeping up. Is it important to talk about that in your next set of reports a year if, if, the, if the report is making that kind of difference in the conversation or in practice? We include a progress indicator um, in each of our goals so that um, both the state or you know, any reader can see whether this is something that not just this state, but any state has, has moved on. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, funders might not like this answer, but w we don't much care whether they moved it because they saw us point it out to them or, or any other reason that, that they moved it, right? We, we want, we, we, we are, I just totally agree with what Eric said, we're, we're there to keep the issue out there and, and keep, um, keep focus on it, but um, you know, if we are the direct catalyst for, for the change, it's great, and, and we, have, we have some good evidence of that. We don't try to systematically carry that. The thing that strikes me is that the two reports that I find have probably have been the most influential were national reports not state level reports. So the first one, and this is going back way in time, was the Coleman report coming out of the 1965, uh, the first iteration of ESEA. Uh, famous uh, sociologist was the first one to find that out of school forces were overwhelming in school forces. So kids who were growing up in poverty, uh, parents who didn't have much education, um, their schools weren't compensating, which really set off 50 years worth of policy changes or at least effort. The other big one is the 1983 
famous a nation at risk, which used this huge language. Like if, we, if a f foreign language had done to us uh, on education uh, what we've done to ourselves, we would have considered it an act of war. Like sort of getting everyone together, saying that we need to do standards, assessments, curriculum, um, uh, higher expectations better. And I think those things galvanized uh, policymakers at the state level, maybe as much as state level reports do? Well, I, I think one of the lessons from nation at risk is we need more Cold War rhetoric and who knows <laughs> what's going on in Crimea if we're kind of yeah. entering that new age. I, I would not argue at all with the importance of those kind of big reports. I've got a copy of the Coleman report actually on the shelf in my office and I've read it and, and taught on it actually. Um, but let's remember that those were very different, especially the Coleman report. I mean, that was a long time ago. Um, and Nation at Risk w really happened before there was a kind of state policy environment in education we recognize today. Can't remember exactly if the Department of Education that had actually been formed kind of as a cabinet level department. It was right about that time. Uh, right, so kind of just, just, just ahead of that. Um, so it was a very different environment. And it's things like a Nation at Risk and kind of what it points out at a national level that I think was part of what spurred, you know, what became a very kind of active next decade in state level policy, which has kind of led us to where we are now, where national takes are important, but so much of what has kind of been driving momentum in education is at the state level now, that, that I think that's just part of the history. And the kind of earlier point about governance, you know, I, I think is also interesting. Um, you know, it's kind of constitutionally kind of enshrined at the state level. And yet, kind of for 150 years before that, we really think about this as something that's an, a, especially a very local enterprise. You look over the past kind of 20 years or so, I, you know, you would see just kind of pound for pound so much more activity at the state level. And I think that's just part of the same evolution. You know, whether you're looking at you know, kind of governance pure and simple, whether you're looking at kind of equity, you know, as a way to get at some of these kind of issues. Um, I think the states just matter a lot more now than, you know, they have kind of historically, part because of things like Nation at Risk, you know, for other reasons as well. Yeah, I totally agree that, you know, right now, if you're trying to figure out what's happening, you know, we're so confused nationally that you can't even get a clear picture of what's going on. So to have, you know, a state-by-state -state analysis is really the only way you're going to figure out what's going on. You know, you have to look at state waivers. Um, you have to look at these, you know, changing teacher evaluation laws, um, changing standards, changing assessments. Everything is, is um, up in the air and in flux. And, you know, you can't, I think we haven't quite figured out what our next sort of big national message is or should be. Um, and states are, are really in the driver's seat right now. Maybe you just came up with the answer. I'm going to take a complete flyer on this. We are at a standstill when it comes to ESEA reauthorization. It, I mean, what now seven years over? Who has ever done a report card on the federal government's policies on teacher quality, on school choice? I mean, going through uh, everything that was in NCLB, but including Title II stuff, IDEA stuff. If your reports are galvanizing action at the state level, would a federal government report card uh, on education policy galvanized. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge is, and like, I actually, you know, it's federal policy now is state waivers, more or less. I mean, you look at NCLB and the legislation is still there and there are still states, I always like to recognize them, that still have to live with NCLB. But for the most part, you're talking about waivers. Waivers can be thousands of pages long to read. Correct. I tried to look just at one of the three principles in accountability or in the waivers. I looked at the accountability systems. I did 16 states and it took me over a year. Mm -hmm. So. And that's without the waivers to the waivers. That's without waivers to the waivers, waiver extensions, waiver monitoring. This is just looking at the initial waiver requests, which had been amended. So you have to keep going back and checking and see what states have done. So, you know, the, the time and capacity it would take to pick any one particular policy and grade it on a national level is, you know, I, I don't know if I question whether the U.S. Department of Education has the capacity or any single organization. It needs to be a much bigger effort if it's going to get done. And we just don't have the data right now. So it, it, it would be awesome to do it. I am, you know, all for trying to figure out nationally um, what's happening in these various reform areas, but I don't think there's that um, 
drive right now or sort of there's not demand for it. Not enough people are demanding it and, um, and it's a big challenge for any one organization to take on. So I think there'd have to be a, lot, a big collaborative effort. Oh, I, I think, I mean, federal policy is obviously a much different animal in a lot of ways than state policy. But even if we go back to, say, the heyday of No Child Left Behind, and there's a lot of reasons a lot of people don't like No Child Left Behind or didn't like No Child Left Behind and the tarnished brand and all that stuff, right? Part of kind of what No Child Left Behind brought about was kind of for specifically what happened at the federal level, right? A lot of what people did not like about the way it unrolled had to do with state level implementation of the policy framework in No Child Left Behind. And you know, w one of the things that I've done a lot of work on is graduation rates and kind of high school policy. And a lot of what you know, really kind of came to the fore in terms of a very dissatisfied national discussion about what the rates are, what the accountability and kind of standards are for graduation rate, had very little to do with what was actually in the federal law. It had everything to do with the way a lot of states chose to implement the kind of fairly broad framework that you often see in federal policy and federal statute. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's interesting to kind of think about how the federal government has approached various policy issues. It's largely through funding. It's kind of often through a, you know, a lens that has to do with, say, with kind of equity or serving particular populations. But a lot of what ends up mattering a lot is kind of how the states kind of take that framework, and it's more or less restrictive in different areas, you know, and kind of put that into practice at the state level. Now, there's qu quality implementation issues at the state level. Um, you know, and I don't want to kind of give the federal government, you know, you know, kind of a, an out, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's a little bit more dynamic than just kind of this is what the feds do, this is what the states do. It's, it's, there's a lot of give and take, I think. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left, so I'd like to see if we can get at least one more Twitter and at least one or two from the audience. Sir? Thank you. A wonderful panel, by the way. I'm Fred Winter with F.A. Winter Associates, previously like probably half the room with the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and, and I would say, before I ask my question parenthetically, I hope we eventually get a question from the room that isn't from a male who is white and over 60, but <laughs> at, at some point. Uh, my question is this, the President has tasked the U.S. Department of Education with developing a rating system for colleges and universities. Um, what in your experience with the report cards for the pre-college systems would you give as advice to the team that's developing the new higher ed rating system? What a great question. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Well, you, we, we, um, we rate uh, teacher preparation programs as, as part of our work, so um, we've waded into those muddy waters already. Um, it, I mean, it, you know, it, it's a challenge, uh, especially very similar to the kinds of things we've, we've talked about. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to set a, a, indicators where every indicator is clearly grounded in research. It's, it's just not going to be there. And, um, or where the perfect implementation uh, is already outlined to, to, how, um, to how you evaluate that. So, um, I mean, I, I, I think our you know, NCTQ's take is, is you've got to do it and, and not you you got to stick your neck out a little bit and um, and and then make you know make changes if if you need to but it, that that is a thorny thorny subject. <laughs> I would say be careful and very thoughtful about the data um, that you choose to include in the rankings. You know, anytime you create any sort of accountability system, what you're trying to do is change behavior. It might be institutional or school behavior. It might be individual behavior. Um, and what's included sends a very strong signal about what matters. Yes. And so to be really thoughtful about when you choose a particular indicator and what the performance standard is for receiving a certain ranking on that, you know, what, what action do you hope that that would spur? And trying to sort of see through what maybe some unintended consequences of those choices could be. Um, and really make sure that you're choosing good indicators, you know, I think um, it's been interesting with NCLB, you know, best intentions, obviously, but a lot of the assessments, you know, that we've been basing all these decisions on, whether it's, you know, what, what schools are low performing or what teachers are low or not effective, you know, we all would readily admit those assessments are not that great right now. They haven't been, they're getting better, but they haven't been that great. So, to, and I think that's going to be a challenge in higher education is just the lack of, of data that we have right now. We really only have good data. Um, on students to take out loans, and that's missing a huge portion of, you know, the population. It's not. It's not universal, and there are a lot of data points we don't have. So I think you're going to have to 
really clean up the data side before you can even start to have a ranking system that sort of has the, the validity and um, you know, will, will be um, something that you know, creates the right incentives for schools. Yeah, I would also say, I agree with the tread lightly um, point of this. The, the thing that strikes me the most is once we start uh, doing report cards on, for example, institutions of higher education graduation rates, um, matriculation rates, and uh, what we're going to find is that there are a lot of the ones that have the lowest ratings are actually some of the institutions that are the best at getting in students who otherwise might not go to college. HCBUs, for example, um, schools that are in uh, more remote areas, and you automatically have this tension. Well, they're good at this, but they're not good at that. So just be aware when you're putting these things together. Um, <laughs> the information that you get might cause some uncomfortable uncomfortable conversations. And I should put a plug in, you know, I, New America does work from pre-K through higher education and workforce, and I'm sure some of my colleagues have a lot of recommendations for you on this very topic that would be um, probably more, more in-depth than anything I could offer. So now, check out our I website. A, yeah, a non-50-year-old uh, white man over here with a question. Uh, my name is Katie. My name is Katie Porter. Um, I'm with the American Youth Policy Forum. And my question has to do with um, transitioning you know, from state to state. Every state in the union is very different in a lot of ways. And I'm sure as a researcher, you all know that how one policy is implemented in, say, Tennessee would be very differently implemented in Wyoming. So based on the research that all three reports present, you know, I would love to get your perspective on how a policymaker in a small state in the East Coast can take lessons from an effective policy in a more rural state in the Midwest, for example. So I don't know that the, the distinction is, is actually as important as the lore around it uh, would mm -hmm. suggest, right? So. On the front end, any parent I've ever talked to in any state, they always talk about the same things that they want for their kids. And, and they, they, they want their kids to be able to grow and learn and achieve and do all these great things. They want them to be able to go to college. That never seems to, to change on the expectations end. And, and, and certainly at the, at the you know, point where students graduate from college, they're competing with each other all across the country for where they're going to go to college, what jobs they're going to get that's be, you know, becoming increasingly uh, popular that you know our, our younger population is, is more mobile the idea, the idea that you're just going to stay in your hometown or even your home state is something that that just isn't as true anymore so on, on the you know expectations end that doesn't seem to be the issue and on on the reality of what happens after the kid graduates they, they certainly have to compete with everybody else so this idea that we somehow have to protect and insulate the k-12 and it has to reflect these unique characteristics of the state that are very different than some other state I just don't see it. I don't get it. I, I, I will say this, when we are looking at our report card and how we grade states, while we want states to implement a set of policies and we believe that there's a way to, you know, we have a rubric for what we consider a bad policy versus a really great policy, we are thinking about whether there are different pathways to get to an A. Um, we are thinking about the, how different policies interact with each other and the idea that it may not be the case that every state has to have every policy. Um, you know, for instance, one of our policies is mayoral control uh, because we believe that it should be some governance alternative uh, that exists. I think our principle would be there needs to be a governance alternative that a governance alternative that exists. Whether that means that every state, you know, Montana needs a mayoral control policy on the books, I, I, I think probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense and it's something that we're thinking through then. What's the pathway that you can get there to demonstrate you've got some way of breaking up the, the current governance model when it's not working? but it doesn't have to be that exact prescription. Um, so, you know, objective, end goal is the same. Maybe the pathway for getting there can, can vary a little bit in terms of the, the policy itself. I, I think that is so right. Um, in, in our experience, for as much as every state uh, tells you how unique they are, for most of the policy areas we look at, we generally see four or five, sometimes a few more distinct models that, that states um, uh, spread them out there. There's certainly not one cookie coder approach across the country, but in most of these policy areas, there are not 51 mm -hmm. approaches. 
Um, and uh, we, we try to, to walk the same line of we, we have a policy goal, but there's not one way that that goal can be met. And we do try to make sure that states can, states can see the different ways. We try to, where we can, build into our best practices different approaches that, that states are taking that will get you there. Yeah, there are different sort of policy levers that you might have in one state versus another, depending on you know, what powers the State Board of Education has versus the governor's office versus the legislature and who's in control of what, but the approaches are sort of finite. Um, so I think I would agree that you know, there may not need to be so much tailoring to each individual state. Um, what, may need to be tailored though is your communications approach around that strategy because that's where you know a local audience might be slightly different from one to another or who who are the key players and you need to know that um, you know you can certainly share strategies between states but that might be where there's more tailoring I yeah think. I, I think kind of where the center of gravity in terms of education and leadership kind of rests within a state at a particular point in time matters a lot I, I think Every state is not absolutely different from every other state in the same way that every district or every school is absolutely kind of exceptional and, and different. So, you know, there would be little point in these kind of 50 state exercises if that was the case, right? Then it wouldn't matter what was going on in Virginia if you're Maryland or vice versa. And, and I think the policy and po political environment, you know, at a given point in time matters a lot, right? There's kind of, you know, kind of go back to your kind of textbooks and kind of undergrad or grad school and kind of political culture. You know, it seems like kind of very archaic and ethereal, but it's kind of real in the sense that you do get regional patterns in terms of kind of local control states. They're still around in some form or another, and, and you know, that kind of speaks to what that state level environment and kind of where kind of momentum, you know, has a potential to be built or kind of how much can be addressed through state level policy versus other approaches. And just the way kind of state leaders, whether you're kind of the state chief or the governor or one of their deputies or whoever, you know, kind of receives kind of state report card types of projects and kind of makes use of them um, varies a lot, right? So you spend a lot of time thinking about kind of states that, you know, want to be at the top of the rankings because they can kind of wave the flag and kind of the we're number one or we're number two or whatever. Um, but actually, that's not always the way kind of this information is used. And there's plenty of cases where states that are at or very near the bottom of the rankings in quality counts or a particular area of quality counts that's more important to a leader in some cases in terms of getting action than being able to stay, say that we're at the top, right? Um, there's a kind of a great example, kind of a few number of years back, I was on a panel with, um, I think, the state chief from uh, New Mexico. New Mexico is very low ranked in, in, in quality counts that year. Um, you know, but that was okay because that was, that wasn't okay. But, you know, there's kind of a silver lining to that because that gave the chief and kind of the department a lot of you know kind of ammunition if you want to think about it. that way to kind of go to the legislator to go to the other leadership within the state say we need more investment we need to put more emphasis on kind of this this and this so even kind of kind of low grades can kind of help support a you know kind of forward moving policy agenda you don't always know how it's going to play and it'll play differently in different states depending on a lot of types of things um, but yeah but it's an it's an important factor I think what goes on. So just briefly, I'm very sympathetic to your question um, and probably a lot more than I would have been like six months ago. My organization recently began two years of work on rural education reform. And so we've had some time to, uh, especially in uh, Idaho, but some states in the deep south take a look at things. And um, I've been very surprised at just how different um, expectations and the interaction between schools and communities are. So for example, there are a lot of very rural communities we've learned who feel this deep tension that they worry that if their students are very, very well educated, they're going to go to very good colleges and never come back. And that by having great schools, these communities are seeding uh, the demise of their own communities. And so they're trying to wrestle with this. So in those places, I, would, I bet they would say, in your report card, if you're going to rate us, you also should be rating economic development in our communities so these kids that leave can actually come back. So I think there should be some nuances. I don't have this all figured out yet, but if you're interested, um, the project is called ROCI DeHo. Um, that's the handle for it, and you can also find it online. Um, I think we're just about at the end of our time. Uh, Anne, should we give everyone a minute to maybe summarize, give final statements? Sure. Um, Want to start? Yeah, so again, thank you so much for, for coming out. I think this has a really been a great discussion, and I've appreciated 
hearing from the graders whose content I am absorbing and using. And I think you know, it's clear that we all gr see the, the utility of these rankings and grades, but also the need to really figure out implementation and how to be thinking about that in a different way. And I think that's sort of one of the takeaways that I'm going to keep chewing on after this, um, after this event and moving forward is how can we sort of move um, from policy adoption to policy implementation and incorporate that also in our work because that's sort of going to be what really um, drives whether we see the achievement results that we want at the end. Uh, so, so thank you, first of all. Um, I, real quick note on the, on the last question to, for, for me to close out. I, I, we often get uh, sort of characterized as, as this is something new, this state-by-state -state advocacy work and changing education policy. And one of the most interesting things we found when we did our first report card last year and we broke open the state codes was how similar state laws actually were. And it goes back to this, this, this notion that they're somehow unique. Somebody, scratch our heads and wonder who, uh, certainly engaged in an advocacy campaign over the last uh, couple of decades to go state by state and make sure that a lot of the personnel policies looked an awful lot alike. Uh, literally the same language, state by state. So, so this is nothing new, this, this you know, engagement of changing state policy to look a certain way uh, is, is nothing that we're inventing. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is change the conversation a little bit and say, well, if we're going to change education policy, who should it really focus on and, and what should it be centered around? Uh, and so you know, hopefully you're all are able to, to take a look at our report card. It's at reportcard.studentsfirst.org. Um, hopefully it's a useful tool. We'd love your feedback on it. Uh, and yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, well, thanks to y'all for coming. Thanks, New America, for hosting. Um, our re State Teacher Policy Yearbook is at nctq.org. This year we launched it with a, um, with a new interactive website that we hope is much easier to search and use and share information on before you couldn't do much besides download the reports themselves. And so we hope it's much more interactive and useful. We'd love your feedback um, on the website and, and also on the report as a whole. Um, the, the, the one note that, that I'll end on is one of the things that was really fun for us this year um, was we went back and took a look at some of the comments because we have this dialogue with the states incorporated into the reports. Um, we pulled out some, some old comments from states a few years ago um, on things that they were now doing that they, you know, not that long ago in 2009 told us simply couldn't be done. That is impossible in this state, you know, that, that um, here's the 10 reasons why we will never go down that path and, and now they, they have that policy in, in place. So, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the shifts are there. You know, we, we just need to, to keep, uh, keep putting the pressure on. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Um, we don't want your feedback. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, edweek.org uh, edweek if you want to find quality counts and all things Edweek. Um, <clears throat> I guess as a part of that, I'm kind of struck by the way we often kind of think of these kind of state re kind of report cards first and foremost as something we do to states. And, and you know, I'm sure edu or quality counts is, is perceived in that way, you know, in, in more than a couple quarters. But I think ideally we like to think of this work as something we do for states, state policy leaders of various kinds and advocates on the ground, um, teachers, students, um, are really kind of who we're doing this for. That's kind of who we want to kind of arm with better information to kind of take and, and you know, kind of you know, make better for themselves. Um, but in our case, and we haven't spent a lot of time talking about kind of the nitty gritties on the operational side, this is something we do very much in partnership with the states, especially when we do state policy surveys. The states are the ones filling out those surveys, and there's a lot of back and forth, and we could not have done quality counts at all, let alone for 18 years, without a lot of involvement from the states, the state education agencies, and so we, we always appreciate that. Um, and. Uh, you know, kind of we're looking forward to kind of continuous work in the future. And so many of the, the changes we've made over the years have come in part from kind of feedback from kind of the general, um, you know, kind of educate K-12 field, as well as states in, in particular. And so if you do have, you know, kind of thoughts that you want to share with us, definitely let us know. We're in one of those phases where we're thinking about those issues quite a lot right now. Okay, for me, just six quick thank yous. 
Uh, number one, to everyone in the audience for being here and participating. Uh, number two, to all the people who are tweeting in or watching or are we live streaming? Live streaming, live streaming out there in the ether somewhere. Um, and then to the panelists, like uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate their work. If you have not read Anne's report on the waivers that she uh, referenced, you are doing yourself grave harm. Um, it is one of the best things I have read in a really long time, and it is as edifying uh, a piece on federal policy that you could imagine. Um, do yourself a favor and read it. Um, Eric and his organization have been pushing as hard as any org uh, out there for the best interests of kids, especially related to ed policy, so they deserve a whole lot of credit. Um, I have to thank NCTQ. When I was working in New Jersey, we actually had um, uh, NCTQ come to our state board and give a presentation because I think we had gotten a D or a D minus that year on our policies. And I learned, thanks to their report, that correct me if I'm wrong, on for our praxis exam, we were, our cut score was like a standard deviation and a half below the mean. Yeah, so we were allowing in through Praxis like 91% of people who took this test. I didn't know that. We were able to change the policy. And it goes without saying, quality counts is like, it's the standard bearer. It's been something that I and probably lots of people in this room have used for years. So please keep it up. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here. And thanks for hosting, Anne. Happy to have you guys. Thank you for coming. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>